Welcome to another virtual Fost North event. Big thanks to our sponsors and partners. Welcome back. And uh, now we have Lars Brinkhoff, who will talk about the ITS, the Inca Incompatible Time Sharing System. So Lars, the stage is yours. Thank you. Hello, everyone. My name is Lars Brinkhoff, and I'm here to talk about the Incompatible Time Sharing System. So first, first of all, uh, what is ITS? Uh, a little overview for my uh, presentation. Uh, what is ITS and what I'm going to talk about its history and some of the special values and features and a little bit about what's going on today. First of all, what is ITS, the incompatible time sharing system? It's an operating system for the PDP 10 family of computers. It was created at the MIT University in 1976 and it had a pretty good run it was kept running until 1990 and it's uh, especially known for its openness and lack of security uh, many people ask me why am i doing this um, yeah, yeah it has a long background I started with uh, home computers and basic programming as a kid. And I got really uh, interested in computers and read all the books in the library. Um, among those, the one picture here, the Hacker's Dictionary, which uh, has a lot of information about ITS. And uh, later, I added uh, PDP 11 support to bin utils. And after that, I also added PDP 10 support to the GCC compiler. So I got started on the, this PDP 10 computer. And uh, I also do it because I, I think it's ITS has a very interesting history and uh, it uh, has something important to tell us even today. And last but not least, I think it's basically more fun than playing a regular computer game um, because it's a lot about learning interesting things and exploring and solving puzzles. So, uh, the PDP-10 computer, this was made by the uh, successful company, Digital Equipment Corporation, which no longer exists. But they were big in the 60s and 70s and 80s. Uh, the PDP-10, uh, it started as the PDP-6 in the middle of 1960s. And uh, new generations kept coming until uh, the family was shut down in the late 80s. So it started with the PDP-6 and then there were four versions of the PDP-10, um, which usually are called KA-10, KI-10, KL-10, and KS-10 for the processor. Uh, this computer it was designed with the LISP in mind, which was uh, a little bit special for this time. In, in one sense, you can even call it like the first LISP machine in a way. Because uh, those who know Lisp, you will know that there is the important, important concept of a console, which has two addresses in one item. So the PDP-10 has an 18-bit address, and two of those fit inside the 36-bit word length. Uh, it has a very nice instruction set. Uh, so um, all the programmers really like this computer and it was also very popular on the uh, predecessor to, to internet today which was called ARPANET which began in the early 70s. 
and it's uh, it's really a big iron mainframe mainframe kind computer. Uh, I squeezed in a little photo at the bottom. This is sm it's a small configuration of a PDP-10, and the uh, CPU alone are these two boxes in the middle. So it's not a small machine exactly. Uh, a little bit uh, a background about what what existed before ITS and why ITS was created. Uh, MIT had a famous artificial intelligence group started in the late 50s. And they, MIT also uh, research time sharing. That is uh, computers which you can use many people simultaneously. Uh, before that, most computers used batch processing where you handed in a deck of cards to an operator. The operator loaded the cards and maybe you got a result back the other day or so. So this was a really awkward way of working. So uh, this concept of time sharing was introduced, which is basically what we all are using today. So the first time sharing system at MIT was called CTSS, Compatible Time Sharing System, and was developed in the early 60s. Uh, to develop this further, uh, the um, Project MAC was started at MIT, which uh, was created to um, make a new, better operating system called Multix. And um, researchers were planning this operating system for many years and then started implementing it for even more years. So the um, artificial intelligence group, they were impatient and wanted something for their, for their own computer. So the, this AI group, they were part of Project Mac and they got a PDP-6 computer uh, at first, they just used it uh, one one by one. So you have to uh, alloc allocate a time share, a time slot for your work. It's maybe one or two hours, and then the next person came along and did uh, his or her work. So they decided that this is uh, too awkward. We also want a time sharing system. So they basically took many of their single user tools and they created a new operating system from scratch. And this happened in 1967, sorry, 1967. Uh, this was, in their view, a better alternative to the previous CTSS operating system and also to Multix. And uh, I included a photo of this very PDP-6 computer to the bottom left. And uh, another picture I found in the ITS file system, which says happiness is not using Multix. So this is this is kind of how the how the people felt about CTSS and Multix. Uh, ITS is uh, quite special because it was created by Hackers, and by hackers, I mean the original hackers, which came from MIT in the beginning. Uh, this is not the computer criminal, criminal of today, uh, but they are enthusiastic programmers. And uh, to the right is one of them, Richard Stallman, pictured in the computer lab. Uh, the hackers, they uh, they wanted to get access to the computer, get work done. They didn't uh, make the operating system as an academic exercise, which they felt was more like what Maltix did. Uh, it was very interactive. Um, typically, when you use a program, uh, when you type one key, something happens. This is uh, in... Uh, uh, opposite of what uh, Maltix did, where you need 
typically use an entire line of text to interact with a program. Uh, they also had no passwords and no file permissions. So uh, anyone was allowed to log in and uh, see all the files. Again, this was because they wanted to work and not have uh, any obstacles. There is also a source code for everything. So everyone could uh, improve programs if they wanted. And they also allowed the guests from outside both people uh, living nearby, kids sometimes, and also people logging in from over the ARPANET. Some of those grew to become uh, hackers and ITS programmers themselves. Well, after ITS uh, was first created in the late 60s, there was a period of uh, early development they got a PDP-10 computer for the AI group, which the PDP-10 is a better version of the PDP-6, basically. Uh, they added hardware for virtual memory in 1970. They connected the machine to the ARPANET to interact with all the other researchers and programmers. And they, two more groups, got their own PDP 10s and installed ITS, the DM and ML groups, dynamic modeling and uh, math lab. Uh, so these are at the bottom. There are the three only photos of those machines I found. So that's the AI PDP 10 to the left, the DM in the middle, and the ML to the right. ITS and the PDP-10 machines, they were actually used for real research, not just for hackers to play around with. Of course, they uh, used them to do artificial intelligence research. Uh, also robotics and computer vision, which is part of AI. Uh, the uh, logo programming language was largely developed with ITS, uh, Lisp and Scheme were heavily influenced by ITS. They even made a special Lisp machine for running Lisp. And uh, two more programming languages that are less well known are Model and Clue, which I'll talk about some more. And there was also a very important application called Maxima, which was used for mathematical uh, calculations. And they were also researching networking because they uh, were attached to ARPANET. Uh, the pictures are uh, a logo turtle, which were used by kids to draw lines on the floor. And the thing in the green room is an IMP interface, sorry, uh, interface meshes message processor, which is kind of the router for ARPANET. So a little bit more about LISP. Uh, it was created in the late 50s by the professor John McCarthy. Uh, it was initially implemented for an IBM machine, but it quickly moved to uh, other machines like the PDP-6 at the Project Mac. So the special uh, Project Mac version of Lisp was called Mac Lisp, which uh, influenced many other Lisp uh, programming, uh, sorry, uh, Lisp dialects later. They had a Lisp compiler, which was really, did really, a really great job of generating code. And like I said before, they made a Lisp machine, which is pictured to the right in the middle. And also the uh, famous Lisp dialect scheme was created with ITS. So Maxima, Maxima was also implemented in Mac Lisp by uh, this professor, uh, Professor Joel Moses. 
it was uh, very important for many researchers on ARPANET because they used it to do mathematical calculations and symbolic manipulation. Since it was written in MATLISP, they received a lot of money to develop MATLISP and its compiler further. And uh, just because of uh, Maxima, they bought two more PDP-10 computers for hosting the development and uh, running Maxima. So it's all, in a way, very important for ITS. Uh, another important MacLisp application is called Shudlu. It's a kind of a, a robot simulation where you can see a robot arm picking up blocks and you can uh, tell it things in a natural language and ask it questions and uh, tell it to solve puzzles like uh, if you need to tell it to uh, put a block on another block and it's already occupied by a pipe pyramid it will figure out for itself that it needs to first remove that pyramid so this is a um, important early application of uh, AI. A little bit more about the Logo programming language. It was created first at the BBN company in the same city as MIT. But uh, early on, it moved to MIT. Uh, the uh, implementation was ported to ITS and later ported to the smaller PDP-11 machine. And they wrote many other versions for one was implementing in MacLisp, and they uh, made a version for the Apple II, which became quite popular. Uh, and uh, it's quite famous for this uh, turtle, the uh, small uh, semi-spherical device, which is a robot that cross lines on the floor. And they also made a special logo machine to run logo, which they uh, try to sell to uh, schools. Uh, the model programming language is quite similar to Lisp. Actually, it's more or less a dialect of Lisp. It was used just used by the one uh, DM PDP-10. But uh, it's quite famous for being the language in which the game Zork was written. This game uh, led to the formation of the Infocom company and uh, later the boom of uh, text adventure games on microcomputers in the 80s. And it was also used to bootstrap the next computer language called Clue. Clue is short for cluster, which really means uh, class or something like that. Uh, this is a very influential programming language, which few people had heard about. But if you ask, uh, for example, the people who made C++ or Perl or Ruby, they will tell you that they knew about this programming language and they were inspired by it. It was the first programming language to introduce data abstraction in a big way, which is something with, which we take kind of for granted these days, but it was a, quite a new idea by, at that time. And it also has all the things you expect from a modern programming language today, like exceptions, iterators, even parametric types. Uh, so it kind of feels like something made in the 1990s, but it was created in the early 70s. And the woman on the photo is Barbara Liskov. She is the one who invented this language. So in the middle 1970s were the heydays for ITS. They created a network file system, which, as far as, far as I know, is the first network file system. They also created uh, raster displays, which were quite new at that time. And these fancy, they added these fancy keyboards with the uh, Meta, Control, 
top and all those um, strange keys, which are typically used with list machines. Uh, in 1975, they bought one more PDP-10, the latest and greatest KL-10 processor, which is pictured to the uh, right. Uh, the famous editor Emacs was created on ITS in 1976. And in the early 80s, when the ARPANET switched to TCP IP, the uh, ITS networking stack was also updated, so they kept up with the times. Uh, people usually like you to play games, so we have many games running on ITS. We have the famous Space War game that first ran on a PDP-1 computer at MIT, but it was also ported to the PDP-6 and 10 computers. We have uh, the MacHack chess program, uh, which was written by an ITS programmer, actually by the ITS program by the programmer who was most mostly responsible for writing ITS, uh, Richard Greenblatt. Uh, he's also an avid chess player himself, so he created a chess program, which was the best chess program for uh, most of the 70s. Uh, there was a flight simulator. Uh, the adventure text game was ported to ITS. Uh, Maze War in the middle. Where you, it's one of the first first person shooter games. And like I said before, that was Sork. Uh, ITS, it's not just about the PDP 10 computer. There were also a lot of smaller computers around, around the central PDP 10 computer. So they still had the old PDP 6. It was running standalone, kind of like a microcontroller of today, if you will. There were many smaller PDP-10 computers to uh, offload the main PDP-10. Uh, the first list machine was called CONS. It was directly attached through shared memory to the AI lab computer. There was also a special Keops chess machine accelerator. There was a GT40, which is a small uh, PDP-11 picture to the upper right. Uh, the IMLAC to the lower left is the one that was used to play the maze game. And the logo machine is to the low, lower right. And uh, all tools and software for these machines were hosted on ITS. So ITS was the development environment system for these machines. Um, ITS has some special features and also limitations. One of the most um, important feature is called PC losering. That means that the, uh, the process, the user program uh, PC, program counter, it's uh, never inside the middle of a system call whenever another process wants to access its state. So if one program is doing, is executing an operating system call, it will either back it out or quickly complete it whenever another program like a debugger wants to see the program. Um, we have uh, processes and even processors available as files, like today. Uh, one of the most prominent features, which you see immediately when you use ITS, is that the user interface, which you see when you log in, is actually a debugger called DDT. Uh, many people find it strange at first, but it's actually a very, ni very nice user interface because it's a debugger, after all, is uh, a perfect program for loading other programs and starting them and examining them if there is something wrong and so on. Uh, like I said before, 
most programs are very interactive. And uh, actually, if you used Emacs before, they kind of have a similar feel to it because they use a lot of control and meta combinations. They, they had also used space device, device drivers like we have today. And for uh, robotics, they had real-time scheduling to control various machines. They had one of the uh, first terminal independent text output systems to adapt many different terminals. But on the limitation side, there was just one level of directories. So you can't have a directory inside another directory. And file names, they have two parts. Each of which can be just six characters. So that's, that's kind of limiting. So in the uh, 80s, there was a decline period for ITS. The old PDP-6 and KA-10s, they were getting harder and harder to keep up running. So they were eventually scrapped. Uh, they were repl replaced by newer KS-10 machines in the mid 80s. Uh, even the newest, greatest KL-10 was shipped actually to Sweden in 1988, where it was kept in storage for many, many years until it was shipped to uh, Seattle a few years ago. And eventually all computers running ITS were shut down in 1990, mostly due to disk and memory problems. Here's something that illustrates the use of ITS over the years. Uh, they are all the uh, unique timestamps from uh, backup tapes. So we can see it sharply increased until the mid uh, 70s. There's a peak in 1976. I think this is due to uh, the new KL10 machine, which hosted many more people at the same time. And uh, throughout the late 70s, where there were, was a relatively stable period, and then a decline in the early 80s. There's one uh, much smaller peak in 1986, probably due to the new uh, KS-10 machines. Uh, another set of data from uh, timestamps uh, are all the ITS version numbers. Uh, as you can see, it starts in uh, 1971, which is when the first backup tapes were written. And at that point, uh, the ITS version number was uh, in the late 600s. And this uh, grew steadily over the years. Uh, we can see a jump in 1984-5-ish. This is probably due to the new KS-10 machines. Uh, which is probably where the, a lot of development were made and new versions were released frequently. And then in the late 19th, we can see the versions are tapering out to finally end at the mid 1600s in 1990. So ITS uh, has some kind has a bit of historical importance importance and uh, still has a legacy today. Uh, the new project was started by, by one of the ITAs, ITS hackers, Richard Stallman. Uh, Emacs, the editor, is still popular today, and uh, GNU project uses the info system, which uses the exact same same files as on ITS. Um, the HOIS network information system took its name from an ITS program. And two major Lisp dialects, Emacs Lisp and Comma Lisp, are heavily influenced by Mac Lisp. The uh, Meta key on found on some keyboards today uh, are probably due to the Emacs editor so can trace it, it's back to ITS. Uh, Unix didn't have any kind of job control in the beginning, 
but it was added by an ITS hacker who uh, mostly copied the features from ITS. And the little more utility program on Unix uh, is very much a re-implementation of the built-in functionality in ITS. A little bit more about the new project. It was started, as many of you will know, by Richard Stallman, who was an important ITS hacker back in the six, uh, back in the seventies. Uh, he was inspired by the ITS values with free software, free information, and sharing. And uh, actually, on the photo is a Dover printer, which it's kind of what ignited. Stallman's uh, sense of uh, importance for free software because he wanted to adapt the Dover software, but uh, he went to the company who made it and they said, no, you can't have it. So he was quite mad at that, which is why he started the new product more or less. Well, after ITS was shut down, uh, quite a lot of people were quite sad, but uh, something new happened, which raised a new hope for ITS. Uh, an ITS hacker wrote a PDP-10 emulator and got ITS running on it in the early 90s. Uh, eventually, there was an emulator with network support. So there was a public ITS machine running on an emulator in the early 2000s. Um, there was uh, some work to make a ready-made disk image to run ITS called the public ITS distribution. And many tools for working with ITS files and special networking protocols were created. And on the photo at the bottom is a, a homemade FPGA computer running and a PDP 10 implementation which runs ITS. And finally, um, I started a restoration project a few years ago, which I will talk about some more. Uh, I had access to some ITS files and later got access even to the MIT archive of the PDP-10 backup files. Uh, it started small as a project to just uh, make a script to install ITS, but this kind of snowballed and cover all the aspects of ITS now. So I've been searching these uh, files and tapes to find interesting programs, uh, locate the source code, figure out how to build it, and uh, debug them to get them fully running, which sometimes also means I have to add uh, more hardware to the PDP-10 emulators. And the photo is an actual picture of a tape from MIT. So that's how they backed up their files back then. Uh, the project, it uh, builds an ITS disk image from scratch. So it uh, starts by uh, booting a few small programs from a tape, virtual emulator tape. It uh, creates a file system on the disk and then loads ITS itself and a few tools to that uh, disk image. And then the script uh, boots ITS and uses the assembler and compilers to build over 300 programs from source code. Uh, myself and a few others volunteers, we fixed many, many bugs in programs. For example, they didn't expect them to run in the in this millennium, so we fixed many Y2K bugs. And we use modern issue tracking and continuous integration and put the source code on GitHub. Uh, we still have some important items which are not done. Uh, the most important maybe uh, the PD original PDP-6 version of ITS. We haven't found it anywhere. Uh, the uh, 
robot simulator Shulu isn't running yet. There was a uh, kind of a re uh, sorry re implementation of ITS on small PDP eleven computer called small ITS, which also is not running yet. And there's always work to do to emulate more hardware. For example, there was a kind of a video camera and a robot arm and some 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 things like that that we'd like to see running eventually. Um, the uh, there's a, a museum in Seattle called the Living Computers Museum. Uh, they contacted me to uh, install ITS on one of their PDP-10 computers. So I did some work for them a few years ago to install ITS on their computer. And uh, actually, we got it running eventually, and uh, it was available from the internet until the corona crisis when they uh, shut down the museum. So it, it's not running on that computer right now, but on an emulator instead. So that concludes my presentation. I included some um, pointers to more information if you want to learn more. There's first of all the uh, source code on GitHub. There's a wiki made by uh, another Swedish person. And my ITS site is called itspdb10.se. And there's a book called Hackers, which has a lot of information about ITS. Uh, I'd just like to point out that this web page does have some uh, access to ITS here. So for example, if I hope this works now, yes. So here is one of the uh, bitmap raster, raster displays being emulated. So I can actually log in and uh, use ITS from here if I like. It's a bit slow because it's running on a Raspberry Pi, but it's working. So that was all for me. OK. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. So uh, fascinating, and thanks for your talk. A personal note here from me. Uh, Lars introduced me to uh, the GNU project and GPL, I think, in the 90s. And it had a huge impact on me. So thanks for that. Uh, that was a personal reflection on my side. Uh, so a couple of questions uh, have popped up here. So the first one is, uh, which I'm going to split into a couple. So <laughs> bear with us. You, you, you're going to stay with us for a while here, Lars. So what is the best way to get started with PDPs today? Uh, well, there's a lot of information uh, about PDP-10s generally. Uh, I have some pointers here about more about ITS specifically, and I'd say that ITS is a very nice way to get started with PDP-10 computers because it's actually very friendly, open, easy to use once you get over the initial hump of learning all the new commands, of course. But it's kind of, uh, it's there for you. It doesn't have any obstacles. You can see all files, you can change all files. It's really a, a plaything for anyone who is inter interested in this. Uh, as a follow-up question there, what emulators to use? Do you have a list somewhere? Um, I don't have a list ready-made, but uh, there are a few, and uh, we support ITS running on them all. So that's, um, uh, first of all, the KLA, KL810 computer, uh, sorry, emulator. It's very good for running uh, ITS and other operating systems. Um, and then there's uh, the uh, SimH project, which added support for PDP-10s now. Uh, it actually has support for all the processors now, so uh, you can have your choice. Um, and there are also a few FPGA projects and so on if you're really into hardware. Okay. Um, okay. <laughs> that was a follow-up question there about hardware. So, is is there a list for for hardware as well? I guess. 
Uh, sure, there are, there are a lot, lot of lists, uh, but um, hmm. for there's of course uh, information on Wikipedia because it's a uh, well-known computer, so they have a lot of information there. And I also like to mention the uh, gunkies.org site. It sounds strange, but uh, maybe I can show you here if you see my screen share. I have this uh, wiki, a lot of information. Uh, where do I click it? There. So they, of course, have a lot of information uh, about PDP-10 uh, computers and uh, hardware versions as well. Uh, so there are some uh, enthusiasts uh, who enter a lot of uh, good information here, more than we will find on uh, Wikipedia. So I cannot recommend that one. Okay, uh, it says here FLGA based uh, hardware question mark. Uh, so that's kind of free hardware. I, I don't know what license the uh, FPGA products use. Uh, so there are about uh, two, three different ones. I can uh, I can send out information later, so we can find out what license they use. But I don't know right now uh, you've been doing a lot of like archaeology work here for a while and by the way I can highly recommend you following Lars on Twitter I will provide links uh, later on so but Lars out of all the stuff you've seen hardware and software what have impressed you the most like considering it's done 60 years ago yeah, sure. There are a lot of things that uh, was invented uh, with ITS that we kind of take for granted today. But um, I wouldn't say anything really stands out as that impressive, but it's just very friendly system uh, that's open to exploration and programming. So that's it's very, if you like programming, it's uh, very nice to get straight access to the hardware even if it's just emulated but it's it's kind of a, a dream machine for programmers to play around with and a lot of uh, quirky hardware that works in strange ways that you can, can explore and try if you like okay um, if the 18 of the bits were address base what did the other 18 bits contain instructions and data question mark Right, so the PDP-10 instructions that are always 36 bits, uh, 36 bits wide, and 18 of those are always the address, and the other 18 are uh, opcode and uh, uh, register information. So that's kind of how they how they designed their instruction set back in those days. They wanted to have uh, the full address range inside one instruction. We don't do that anymore because it would be very awkward with 64-bit instructions always. But that's, that's how it worked back then. And with 18-bit small address space, it's, it still works. OK, and that sums the entire thing up. So I will leave hand over to you, Juan. So thanks and goodbye. Thank you. Big thanks, and we will be back at four. So see you then. <laughs>